So what we're going to do is we're going to go through some of the calculations together. Some of them we might set up and I'll have you do them. Uh, and then some of them you'll just do. Uh, for this lab, though, we'll start. So I'm going to assume that I'm at the top of my page. And I'm going to label it, label it calculations. And so for calculation one, it says write the balanced net ionic equation for the reaction that occurs. And I think your guys is still just says write the balanced equation. So what we're going to do is we're going to write the molecular equation and then the net ionic equation because net ionic is what we need to practice because that's what college board wants. Then it says to calculate moles, the moles that are consumed and the moles of reaction. So we have kind of four different things that we're looking at here. So I'm going to start. Right, here's calculation one, or number one, I, I should say the calculations, but I'm going to make sure I label this balanced equation. And then I'm going to go ahead and write my balanced equation underneath it. So for this equation, if we think about what we had, we had HCl. Remember, acids are always aqueous. So we had aqueous hydrochloric acid. And then we had baking soda. Baking soda is sodium hydrogen carbonate or sodium bicarbonate, NaHCO3. What state of matter was the baking soda? Solid. Solid. <laughs> Listen, sometimes people are like, um, what was it? Like, it's a solid. <laughs> um, so this is a double replacement reaction. Yeah. Right, double replacement reaction here. Sodium and hydrogen are going to replace each other. So one of the products will be NaCl. Now NaCl is ionic, right? It's a salt, but because it has Na plus in it, it was in solution. NaCl was aqueous. So NaCl is aqueous. And then the other product, so looking at the other product, I'm going to write it up here, but it's actually an unstable substance. So the other product should actually be H2CO3. That's called carbonic acid. Carbonic acid is unstable. It actually decomposes. What was one of the observations that you made when you mixed the two together? Is it? It bubbled, right? So you had a gas. Well, one of the gases that you have is CO2. So from carbonic acid here, one of the substances that it decomposes into is CO2. Well, if you take CO2 away from this, you take the C and two of the O's away, what are you left with? H2O. So H2CO3 is unstable and actually decomposes into CO2 and H2O. That always happens. That's why you saw the bubbling, because it produced CO2 gas. Now, if we want to look at the net ionic equation, if we want to look at the net ionic equation, we have to decompose, or not decompose, but break apart, strong electrolytes. The only state of matter that could potentially be broken apart is what? Aqueous. So baking soda cannot break apart. Carbon dioxide cannot break apart. H2O cannot break apart. The only potential substances that can break apart is HCl and NaCl. Remember to be a strong electrolyte. It needs to be a strong acid, a strong base, or a soluble salt. Is HCl a strong acid? Yes. Yes. So HCl will actually break apart into H plus which is aqueous, plus Cl minus, which is aqueous. NaHCO3 cannot break apart, so I'm going to leave that alone. Will NaCl break apart? Yeah. Yeah, it's a soluble salt. Cl minus. And then CO2 gas stays together, and H2O liquid stays together. 
So what we actually have here, if we want to label each of these, this is the molecular equation. This is the complete ionic equation. What do I have to do to write the net ionic equation? Cancel out spectators. Do I have any spectators here? Yeah. Cl minus, that's the only spectator ion. It has to be an ion to break apart or to cancel out. So the net ionic equation is H plus plus NaHCO3 solid. And that produces Na plus plus CO2 gas plus H2O liquid. So there's our balanced equation. We have the molecular, the complete ionic, and the net ionic. The second part of number one says calculate the number of moles of each reactant initially present. So moles of each reactant. That's what I'm going to label this part of the calculation. Moles of each reactant. This is still part of number one, so I'll just leave that numbered. So you're labeling each calculation. So your two reactants that you have are HCl and sodium bicarbonate. So if I want to look at HCl, what information do we have about HCl that will help us figure out how many moles we had? Concentration and volume. This is where everybody's calculations are now going to be different. Our concentration, I believe ours was all one molar. Remember, molarity is moles over liters. Here is where you put your volume. If you had 95 milliliters, that is 0 0.095 liters. If you had 100, that's 0 0.1 liters. If you had 90, that's 0 0.09 liters. You can plug in your volume and solve for moles. Plug in your volume so you can solve as we go through. <laughs> it's solve for your moles. Wait. <laughs> What was your what was your volume? Ninety five milliliters. Yeah. Uh, you can keep it to like three. That's fine. Yeah, keep it to three. Yep. And then our other reactant was sodium bicarbonate. It's up to you if you want to box or underline whatever makes it easy to go back and find easily. Yeah, if you want to box it. So baking soda is sodium bicarbonate. You started with a certain mass of sodium bicarbonate. Somewhere between one and two grams. Again, this is where everybody's calculations are different. If you use, I'm going to assume I used exactly one gram. Just so you can see the setup here. Two grams. <laughs> I said one to two grams. Yeah, but you should use exactly two grams just to spice it up. Just to, just to spice it up. Well, you know, then your answer should be twice as much as mine. Okay. <laughs> so how do I go between grams and moles? What do I need? Molar, molar mass. So if we look up the molar mass of sodium bicarbonate, NaHCO3, I'll make it easy for you. It's 84.008. The molar mass of baking soda is 84.008 grams per mole. So you take your mass and divide by the molar mass. So if I had one gram, I got 0 0.0119 moles of baking soda. Well, you know what you're doing, right? <laughs> it's not dumb. It's yeah. not dumb. 
I can do what I is it? Next I have in my calculator 0.0238. That's yeah, that's double. <laughs> Carry the one. Oh, Carry okay. the one. <laughs> so there are our moles of each reactant. Now, the second or the next part of this says the moles of each reactant consumed. So I'm going to stick with using different colors. So here's how we look at moles of each reactant consumed. Now, if we look at the balanced equation, it is a one to one ratio. One of these is the limiting reactant. It shouldn't matter how much of each you use. We all should have the same limiting reactant. If not, something went very wrong. Looking at your values here and knowing that it's a one-to-one -one ratio, which one was the limiting reactant? Um, the smaller one. All right, should be the baking soda. Yeah. All right, should be the baking soda. So I'm going to make that note first. Sodium bicarbonate is the limiting reactant. That means that sodium bicarbonate gets used up completely. All of the sodium bicarbonate gets used up. If it's one to one, how much HCl gets used up? That same amount. So uh, again, I'll go based off of mine because baking soda was the limiting reactant. I would say 0 0.0119 moles of baking soda is used. Because it's a one-to-one, -one, I use that same amount, that same number of moles of HCl as well. There's moles of each reactant consumed. Because baking soda is limiting, that gets used up completely, and it's a one-to-one -one ratio, so you use up the same amount of HCl. And then the last part of this says the moles of reaction that occurs. Moles of reaction is the same as the moles of everything that was consumed. So I'm going to do it over here. I would go down underneath here, but I just want to save some space. So the moles of reaction. The moles of reaction is the same as how much was used up. Think about like if, if this were a, a table, that's the minus. And that's all we need for the moles of reaction. In the parentheses, I'll put same as limiting reactant. So it's the same value as the limiting reactant. So when it says how many moles of reaction, it's the same as our limiting reactant. So that was the first calculation. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to set up the second one over here. And you can actually work through the second calculation um, with your lab partner. You can go through and answer it on your own. But for number two, again, I would normally be doing this all in like one after another after another. I'm just saving some space up here. So number two says, using your observations, predict the sign, positive or negative, of delta H, delta S, and delta G, and justify your response. So even though this isn't a calculation, we still want to label it. So I'm going to label it predictions. That's why I'm going to label this. And we need to predict all three variables. So I'll set it up like this, delta H, reaction, uh, delta S, reaction, and delta G, reaction. So here you can put whether it's plus or minus and then justify. Plus or minus, justify. Plus or minus, justify. Now this is your prediction. I want you to look at based on what you observed. Or look at the balanced equation. All right, delta S, you just look at the balanced equation. 
delta G. You think about, did it happen on its own? So when you put the two together, did the reaction happen on its own? That tells you delta G. Delta H might be a little trickier, but still, this is just your prediction. This is your prediction on whether you think it was exothermic or endothermic based on your data. So go through and make your predictions for number two while I get this erased to set up number three. When you're predicting your sign of delta S, remember to relate it to states of matter. Well, delta G is negative because the reaction happened on its own. Oh, fair enough. Yeah. Um, because that's what your sign of delta G tells you. So since you know, since you saw the reaction happening on its own, that tells you delta G was negative. So once you've made your predictions, and we're going to talk more about what they should have been as we're looking at the calculations, um, but these were your predictions. So you were predicting what you thought the signs were and why you thought those were the signs. For calculation three, so that was it for two. For calculation three, there, were, there are different calculations in this one again. So calculation three says approximating the density and specific heat of HCl as the values for pure water. And it says, why would this be justified? Well, think about HCl. Acid is dissolved in water. Right? We dilute acid with water. So we're assuming that the HCl solution has the same density and specific heat as water. We're going to calculate three things. The mass of the mixture, the temperature change of the reaction mixture, and the amount of heat released or absorbed by the reaction. And I said be careful to use the correct sign and indicate units. I gave you the two uh, equations that are useful for this. So this is bringing back in thermochem and calorimetry. So for Calculation three, I labeled the three things that we're going to be looking at. You can label one at a time and work through it as we work through it. So first, the mass of the reaction mixture. We need the mass of everything that was in that styrofoam cup. Well, your volume, your volume of HCl, whatever your volume was, write that down. Um, say what? Oh, yeah, you can use, yeah, use milliliters. Because what's the density of water? One gram per milliliter. So whatever your milliliters of HCl were, that is the same as the mass of HCl. Right, these are the same number. So if you had 90 milliliters of HCl, that's 90 grams of HCl. Because we're assuming that the density is the same as water. So for the HCl, the reaction mixture was not just HCl, it was also baking soda. So we're going to add them. Grams of HCl plus grams of baking soda. So whatever your mass was. So maybe you had 90 milliliters, which is 90 grams, and one gram of baking soda. That'd be 91 grams total. If you had 100 milliliters of HCl, that'd be 100 grams. And two grams of baking soda, that'd be 102. So here's your mass of your reaction mixture, and that's going to be useful as we get down to the MC delta T. Temperature change. We're doing change in temperature. How do we calculate delta T? Final minus initial. It can be negative. A negative. Delta T will indicate an endothermic reaction for solutions. So you're going to do final minus initial. Should we write the delta T? Or you can plug your numbers in. Okay. Yeah. Um, I don't know if you guys got it, but it's it's loading. My text is loading. It's sending. She said thank you. Oh, she said thank you to me. 
but it, <laughs> yeah. it should be on its way. But I got you. Uh, so again, temperature change, final minus initial. So there's our delta T. Now the heat of reaction. Here is where it says these two equations will be useful. Q of solution. The solution is the surroundings. The reaction was our system. So I'm going to start with Q of solution equals MC delta T. This is why it was important to have the mass of the overall mixture. So I'm going to just label everything. You can plug your numbers in. The mass, M. That's going to be the mass of reaction mixture. C is the specific heat. You guys remember the specific heat of water? Uh, yeah. 4.184. Wow. Specific heat of water is 4.184 joules per gram degree Celsius. And so then your delta T is your delta T. So notice how we have grams, we have Celsius, those will cancel. When you have your answer, your answer is in joules. Include units. Now that is your heat of solution. So I guess I'll do Q solution here. Q reaction is equal but opposite in sign. I bet you guys got Q solution to be negative, which means Q reaction is equal but opposite in sign. So opposite in sign. So you guys probably got Q solution to be negative. Q reaction is just going to be the positive value. This was an endothermic process. This was an endothermic process because what happened is the reaction was our system. We took the temperature of the surroundings. Temperature of the surroundings decreased because the system absorbed energy. So this was an endothermic reaction. So Q solution is a negative number, MC delta T. Q reaction is just opposite in sign. So that was calculation three. We had three different things, but notice how they all built off of each other. So then calculation four. Calculation four says calculate the experimental delta H reaction from delta H reaction equals Q of reaction over moles of reaction. So I'm going to actually label this experimental delta H. So experimental delta H. So it's what we got from the lab. And they gave us the equation to use. Delta H of reaction was Q of reaction from number three over moles of reaction, which we labeled in number one. Q reaction is what you just got in number three, moles of reaction is what we calculated in number one. We labeled moles of reaction in number one. It was the same value as the limiting reactant. Q reaction was positive. Moles of reaction was positive. Why? So it's going to be big because it's joules per mole. Right, you're going to get a big number. I'm not boxing this big number, though. 
Because delta H is usually given in what? Uh, joules. I mean, kilojoules. Kilojoules. So divide by a thousand. Your answer. Your answer is in kilojoules per mole of reaction. It should be positive. So your initial answer is in joules per mole, but it's a large number. Divide by a thousand to get kilojoules per mole. There's the experimental delta H. Now five, I'm gonna come over here. I'm just gonna label five for you. Because I think you guys can actually work through five. Um, so calculation five is on the back of the lab. And we have this information. So five says, use the values given in the table above to calculate the accepted values of delta H reaction and delta S reaction. So what I'm gonna do, again, this would go in my lab notebook after my number four, but I wanna show you how I would label this. I'm going to label this accepted, accepted delta H reaction. So the accepted delta H of reaction, and then also the accepted delta S reaction. Now look at what you're given. You're given the heats of formation and you're given the standard entropies. This is just the equation from the equation sheet. Delta H reaction is the sum of the heats of formation of products minus the sum of the heats of formation of reactants. So again, delta H reaction is the sum of the heats of formation of the products minus the sum of the heats of formation of reactants. Use the net ionic. Yeah, the net ionic will be easier because you have like Na plus and Cl minus, uh, H plus. So use the net ionic equation as you're looking at the products and the reactants. Then you're going to do the same thing for delta S. Do we need to write out the equation? This you don't, I would at least show your work like one step of it, um, but you don't have to write out like the full equation. Oh, no. And just to make sure that I give you the percent error formula, I'm going to just quickly set up at least number six. But once you solve for the accepted values, and then you can compare it to your predictions. Um, so again, I know you're, you might not be quite done with number five, that's fine. I do wanna look at number six to give you the equation. So calculation six is calculate the percent error of delta H reaction in your experiment and give one plausible explanation for your error. Be sure your error accounts for whether your delta H was too high or too low. So, calculation six. I'm gonna label percent error. And then also I will have source of error. The percent error formula. All right, percent error formula, and I labeled these in a specific way to help with the percent error formula. So percent error is the absolute value 
of experimental minus accepted over accepted times 100. This is the percent error of delta H. This is the percent error of delta H. So you're plugging in your experimental delta H. That was from number four. Your accepted delta H, which was from number five. Multiply by 100. That gives you your percent error. Sources of error. This is calorimetry. So think about what could happen um, to cause error. I'm not going to put it in sentence form, obviously. When you're answering source of error, you want to pick one and talk a little bit more about it. So I'm going to list different sources of error. You can pick one that, that you think that your group did, because it only says pick one. Um, but then talk a little bit about it. So if the lid was not on the entire time, right, that means that heat escaped. So you got a lower delta H than what you should have. Maybe the reaction didn't go to completion. So if you notice that you had some baking soda left in the bottom, the reaction didn't go to completion. Not all the baking soda dissolved. Uh, maybe, you, maybe you spilled some baking soda. All right, so you didn't actually have all of the heat that you should have because some of the baking soda spilled. So you pick one source of error and talk about how it could affect your data. And then lastly, calculation seven. I'm just going to label the calculations and you can go through. Um, but calculation seven has you calculating three things. The first thing is calculating delta G of the reaction. Notice it says using accepted values of delta H and delta S. Oh, that tells you what equation you need. You're going to be using delta G equals delta H minus T delta S. Don't forget temperature uh, needs to be in Kelvin. All right, temperature needs to be in Kelvin. And it tells you what to use for your temperature. Just make sure you convert Celsius to Kelvin. Then it says write the equilibrium expression. So this has you thinking about the expression and what to include in the expression. That's K. Products over reactants don't include solids and liquids. And then lastly, it wants you to calculate the value of KEQ. So value of KEQ, right here are the two equations you're using. But for KEQ, remember to pay attention to units. So pay attention to your units. Delta G is going to be in kilojoules. Pay attention to your S as well. Focus on units for everything in example seven. Entropy is in joules. Make sure everything gets converted. Check your units for KEQ. And then you just have a conclusion. 